fame is uh, a double-edged sword, and very few people can really deal with fame. Uh, if you were given a choice between fame and fortune, take the fortune, because fame is not for every man. Not for every man is certain journeys, and uh, so fame is very costly if you're not careful uh, on how to tame fame than fame attain you. In the 1990s, there weren't many names that were bigger than MC Hammer in the hip-hop scene. Hammer had the parachute pants, flashy clothes, the charisma, and the dance moves that were so good that he decided to ensure his legs. You really couldn't touch this. My, 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 my this. music hits me so hard. Makes me say, oh my Lord, thank you for blessing me. What a mind to rhyme and too hype me. It feels good when you know you're down. A super dope homeboy from the Oak Town and I'm known. This was the golden age of hip hop and MC Hammer's numbers were as good as anyone's. It's not spoken about enough, but you've got to give Hammer his flowers because he took hip hop to another level of popularity. I mean, this man's album is the first ever hip hop album to go diamond. Hammer was like hip hop's first pop star because he made rap mainstream. And what makes MC Hammer's achievements even more remarkable is that he was going against the grain as a rapper. This was the era of gangster rap. Every MC rapped about the hood, gang life, and how tough the streets were. But Hammer was an entertainer. He wore flashy clothes, danced a lot, and never tried to act or look tough. This was why Hammer was criticized for going against hip hop culture. Uh, I get a lot of flag from the other rap artists because I refuse to uh, rap their particular style or, or pretend like life is always so bad, everything is hardcore, when I think as a person, there's many characteristics uh, you know, to an individual's personality. During this period, many rappers dissed Hammer as they saw him as an easy target because he wasn't a gangster or about that street life. He was just an entertainer. So you had the run DMC who simply said, Hammer can't rap. <laughs> what do you think, Joe? What do you think about rap now and in, in the direction? Well, I think it's, you know, it's just expanded more. Um, Is it too you know, commercial? No, nah, it's not too commercial. I mean, like Jam Master Jay said, you could rap to any type of music, be it jazz, rock and roll, reggae. But hip hop, you know, the, a lot of the real hardcore rap records don't get played because a lot of people don't accept it. And there was Redman who dissed Hammer's mama on his album and said Hammer wasn't shit. But don't be fooled into thinking MC Hammer was a man anyone could mess with. Hammer was actually a man you don't want to play with. Because behind the flashy persona, hair and pants, and all the dancing, MC Hammer was really scared of no one and had some mean dudes in his circle. The difference between MC Hammer and the rappers who dissed him is that while they chose to do it on wax, MC Hammer was the kind to just pull up on you. Redman stated that after he dissed Hammer on his album, MC Hammer wasted no time in setting him straight. Look, that goddamn MC Hammer, very serious about beef. Y'all motherfuckers laugh and y'all joke about Hammer. No, 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 no. That nigga was deep with niggas. And he used to what anybody who talked shit come to the Bay Area, they was in for it. Yo, even when I said about Hammer, yo, I said, listen to my first album. When I did the skit, and I was like, oh, you know what? That goddamn MC Hammer, fuck him, fuck his mama and the whole nine. That nigga approached me. He was like, Red, I'm going to tell you something. You're young, but I don't allow nobody talking about my mama. You understand me? I said, yes, sir. <laughs> Redman only got off lightly. Some rappers aren't so lucky after dissing MC Hammer. Hammer was so serious with beef that he allegedly put a hit on a rapper that dissed him. You see, Hammer was born and raised in Oakland, California. He grew up poor and was raised by his mom as his parents separated when he was just five years old. Hammer grew up in a hood that was dominated by drugs and crime. And he could easily have been involved in the streets at a very young age. However, Hammer stated that his love for his mom is what made him stay away from that life. Instead, he found other ways to make money. Hammer loved baseball. He hustled tickets from the Oakland A players and resold them in the Oakland Coliseum parking lot. Hammer had a passion for dancing and performing from a very young age. He danced and did splits in the parking lot, and his talent eventually caught the eyes of the team owner, Charles Finley. 
Finley hired Hammer as a clubhouse assistant in Batboy. Hammer was so good at his job that he was promoted to executive vice president. Hammer's job now included taking calls and giving Finley play-by-play -play rundowns of the games he didn't see. It was during his period with the Oakland A players that he got the name MC Hammer. Hammer's real name is Stanley Kirk Burrell. However, one of the players, Reggie Jackson, realized that Hammer looked so much like another player on the team, Hank Aaron. Hank Aaron's nickname was actually the Hammer, and the young Stanley Burrell was given the same nickname. MC Hammer actually wanted to be a baseball player, but he didn't make the final cut after trying out for the San Francisco Giants. After graduating from high school in 1980, MC Hammer actually went to college and was studying communications, but it didn't take too long before he dropped out of school. After leaving school, Hammer then decided to join the Army. He was a member of the Navy and he was stationed in California for most of his three years, but he also spent about six months in Japan. After his honorable discharge from the Navy, Hammer became quite religious and started attending church. This was also when he delved into music. He and his friend John Gibson began a Christian rap group called Holy Ghost Boys. However, the Holy Ghost Boys separated even before they released their first album. Fortunately for Hammer, he was able to get two Oakland A players to invest in his dream. Mike Davis and Dwayne Murphy gave Hammer $23,000 to set up his own company. Hammer backed himself and started Busted Records. With his indie label, Hammer released his debut album, Feel My Power, in 1986. And just to let you know just how much of a hustler Hammer was, he sold the records from his basement in the trunk of his car. But despite this, Hammer still managed to sell over 60,000 copies. Hammer finally signed a major record deal two years later. He signed with Capitol Records in 1988, and it didn't take long for the record company to recoup their money. Under Capitol Records, he reissued his first album and now called it Let's Get It Started. And this was when MC Hammer started doing crazy numbers. His album went two times platinum, and Hammer was truly just getting started. He dropped his third studio album, Please Hammer Don't Hurt Him, in February 1990. And this was when Hammer took over the whole industry. He was criticized for repeating his lyrics and relying on sampling, but Hammer still ended up having the best-selling album of that year, and this album also earned five Grammy nominations. This album would also be the first rap album to be nominated at the Grammys for Album of the Year. This is the period that was known as Hammer Time. MC Hammer became the biggest name in hip-hop and also one of the biggest names in the industry after he released his album. However, most of the other rappers never respected Hammer. Uh, I get a lot of flag from the other rap artists because I refuse to uh, rap their particular style or, or pretend like life is always so bad, everything is hardcore, when I think as a person there's many characteristics uh, you know, to an individual's personality. Hammer introduced the world to pop rap and his songs were never focused on lyrics or any dope bars. And because he never acted or seemed tough, most rappers saw him as an easy target. MC Hammer was that guy almost everyone was dissing either for his dance moves, slick back hair, and his parachute pants. The pants came about uh, in 1978 during the disco era uh, in my city, one of the hot things was uh, suits from the 40s and 50s, the baggy suits, the baggy pants. Stop! Hammer time! And because of the freedom in the baggy pants and the, and the baggy suits, it allowed us to, to move more freely on the dance floor, so... But fam, don't be fooled by his genie pants and clean-cut image. There's a difference between the MC Hammer that you and the mainstream audience see on your screens and the MC Hammer that the streets knew. Hammer's family allegedly had ties with the drug lord, Felix Mitchell, who was the leader of the 69th Avenue Mob, a criminal organization that ran most of the streets in Oakland. Hammer and his brother are also affiliated with the High Street Bank Boys. However, most people never knew just how connected and dangerous Hammer was. One of the rappers that experienced just how dangerous Hammer was is LL Cool J. LL Cool J dissed MC Hammer on his song Till the Break of Dawn. And when Cool J came to do a show in Oakland, Hammer's people decided to pay him a visit. They pulled up backstage and an argument broke out shortly after. LL Cool J was reportedly punched in the face and had to run out the door. 
and MC Hammer's people weren't even done yet. The next day, they followed LL all the way to the airport, and they basically ran him out of the city. But this isn't the craziest story from a rapper who crossed Hammer's path. Hammer was also dissed by the hip-hop group Third Bass on their song The Cactus when one of the members, Pete Nice, rapped, The Cactus Turned Hammer's Mother Out. Hammer saw this as Third Bass dissing his mother, and he wasn't going to deal with this in the studio or on a mic. Shortly after this, Third Bass were on their way to promote their album in LA, which means they would be on MC Hammer's turf. And Hammer allegedly made his presence felt even before they got to the city. While Third Bass were on the plane, the president of Def Jam at the time, Carmen Ashurst, received a call. The caller was allegedly MC Hammer's brother, Louis Burrell, and he told her that Third Bass will be killed after they arrive in California. Thankfully, Carmen took this threat seriously. She called Russell Simmons and informed him of the threat. Russell Simmons found a way to reach out to Eric B, who confirmed that the threat was indeed real and serious. Eric B stated that someone had placed a hit on third base and offered the Roland 60 Crips $50,000 to take out all the members of the group. Eric B calls Russell and goes, yeah, it's true. There's a hit. There's a hit. Uh, Rolling 60 Crips, 30,000 members, $50,000 dead. So Russell says to Eric B, well, how do we stop this? And Eric says, nah, you should just let it happen, and hangs up the phone. Russell Simmons then hired Crips member Barefoot Pookie and OG to protect the rappers. One of the members of third base, MC Search, thought this was all BS and didn't believe he was trying to kill them. Instead, he decided to take his girlfriend shopping at the Beverly Center, and Pookie decided to go with him for security. While Search was signing autographs, the Crip members were already closing on him, ready to pull the trigger. But Pookie pulled some strings, intervened, and ensured Search and his girl weren't touched. Got your head down, you're signing autographs. And I started to look up, and there's these dudes coming from south and west, you know, and they're just walking over, whatever. And I'm signing autographs, and I look up, and I'm signing autographs, and, and as they get closer, the dude over here, he pulls the rag up. Dude over here, he pulls the rag up. They start to spread the girls, and as they come up to me, Pookie whistles, everything stops, he throws up some signs, whatever signs he throws up, and <laughs> it's one dude right in front of me who's got his hand on his ratchet, pulls down his mask, and he goes, yo, man, I, finna, I, I, I love that record, but I was finna smoke you right now, homie. And the dude right next to me comes over, he goes, yo, can I get an autograph, man? And he's like, yo, homie, I was finna smoke you too. You know, fucking Pookie didn't say nothing. I was finna smoke you, man. But this wouldn't be the last time that the third base rappers were almost killed for dissing Hammer. A few days after this incident, third base were on a morning radio show in LA, and this time they were threatened while on air. He takes a call live. Greg Mack, who's this? Rolling 60 Crip, and word we finna kill them. Boop! Ah, out! <laughs> Security grabs us. We run out the fucking building. We get into the van. We start heading down the, the, the hill. There's two blue cars. And these dudes get out, Mac 11s, pointing at the fucking vehicle. Pookie jumps out, <laughs> throws his signs up. They get back in, they leave. Third base barely survived this incident, and they left LA immediately after they were done with all the events they were booked for. But this tells you just how dangerous Hammer was. Hammer was very smart to portray a clean-cut image, but for anyone who disrespected his name or made the mistake of thinking he was soft, MC Hammer made sure he set them straight.